33-year-old male found dead a few days ago. Someone amongst them is our killer. This is the gunman from Berkeley last night. What I'm phoning about is to tell you exactly why I've done what I've done. Police are saying there is a heightened risk to people's safety tonight. We have decided to offer a £10,000 reward. A normal week in the summer was ruined by armed police arriving in the town. The vehicle checkpoints continue all around the village. And amidst the green moorland, the black sight and barrel of a marksman's rifle. I didn't think he would do something like that. I just didn't think he would actually kill someone. We had clear, declared intent to harm members of the public or members of Northumbria Police. You couldn't get any clearer than that. For me, you can't get any more dangerous than that. On Friday the 9th of July, 2010, at around 7 p.m., a man holding a gun emerged from the woods surrounding the town of Rothbury, Northumberland. He's holding the firearm to himself and is non-compliant at the present. His sighting marked the final stages of one of the biggest police operations the country had ever seen. In a line. Raoul Moat, Britain's most wanted man, had been found. Moat was contained challenged to put his weapon down, but simply dropped to the ground and put the gun to his head. Negotiations between Moat and the police would continue for the next six hours. The eyes of the world were centered on Rothbury, with the standoff being broadcast live on TV and radio. The events that led to the armed standoff in this quiet corner of the country actually began years earlier when Raoul Moat met Samantha Stobart in a Newcastle nightclub. Sam used to love to go out, discos. She was going to the nightclubs since, since she was about 15. Her mum used to take her to the nightclubs when she was 15, on a school night. <laughs> she met him on a night out in Newcastle Big Market when he was working as a bouncer on the doors. Because Samantha was slim and young and blonde, Raoul made a beeline for her, <laughs> that was it. She, she fell hook, line and sinker, that was, it was her world. Their relationship, it blew hot and cold. One minute they were all lovey-dovey, the next it was arguments. And he was very abusive to her. You're not going out, you're not going to fucking jealous about that, huh? No. So you know what? And then he would come over and he would give her the soft soap again and she would go back <laughs> and it would all start all over again. When I first met Raoul, I, re I liked him. I thought he was nice. He would do anything to help you. But once you got on the wrong side of Raoul, if you said something you didn't agree with, that was it. He would fall out with you and you would face the consequences. Raoul had to have a girl on his arm. He had to. And she had to be good looking and she had to be slim and fit and well toned. He liked everybody to envy him. I think he was a control freak. He wouldn't like let her out the house with makeup on and things like that. He always had to be with her, even if she just was if she was going to the shops, he had to be with her. Ralmert's an interesting character. Not that unusual among men who are controlling or domineering in their relationships. Some of these characteristics for Raoul Mote have included suspiciousness, jealousy and control. These are often found in relationships where people in themselves are actually quite insecure, but they're hoping to compensate that for that through controlling others. He had a difficult childhood, a diff difficult relationship with his mother. A lot of people have said he was so determined to have a normal family life with Samantha. I think when that broke down, that's when everything unraveled for Raoul. Raoul Mote was 37. A native of the northeast of England, he was father to several children, including one with his current partner, Sam. Although he was known to police, his criminal record contained few clues to the havoc he would go on to cause. He wasn't a career criminal or a, a 
criminal of any significance from the policing uh, point of view. He was certainly somebody who had come to our attention, was known to us, had about 12 arrests over a 10 year period for lower level assault type incidents. But he was known to us and other agencies for his family background. He had a history of domestic abuse in his relationships. But from his background as a door supervisor and a door steward in, in Newcastle, he certainly came to the attention of the police in terms of the, the occasional arrest for assault. Moat was a keen bodybuilder and also used steroids. One of the things about steroids is the research shows that not everybody becomes more aggressive through prolonged use of steroids. What seems to be happening is that aspects of an individual's character are exaggerated as a result of steroid abuse. So some people may become more aggressive, others might not. Once when she'd come over to mine, he'd picked her up and thrown her against the wall. Then he calms down and he's full of apologies and he, he you know, he, he, and I used to think it must be this, whatever he's taking, steroids or whatever, it's got to have some effect on them. I would call it his ride rage. That's what I used to say, you on your ride rage again, of his steroids. By 2010, Samantha had decided she'd had enough of her violent boyfriend. And in the spring of that year, she was presented with the perfect opportunity to break free. Raoul Moat was sent to prison in April of 2010 after being convicted of an assault on his, his young daughter. But I think it's important to point out that they had actually been separated for quite a while. And while Raoul Moat was in prison, I think Samantha probably saw that as an, an opportunity to put some distance between themselves. And it was while he was in prison that she, she tried to finalise and finish the relationship and, and totally sever links with him. But he was a very controlling character and he wasn't prepared to let Sam do that. And, and it was certainly something he didn't want. One of the difficulties for people who get involved in controlling relationships is that, that they need a willing partner, somebody who's prepared to go along with that. When the relationship is threatened, it's a threat to that individual who's controlling. They don't want to lose that. That's what they've worked hard to try and um, manage. And that's when people can react quite viciously. Raoul Moat's revenge was certainly vicious. Not only did his girlfriend want rid of him, he was stunned when Samantha revealed she had actually met someone else while he was in prison. His name was Christopher Brown, and it was a relationship that would have a tragic ending. In the spring of 2010, Raoul Moat was serving time in prison for assault. During his time inside, his girlfriend Samantha had announced she was leaving him and had a new man in her life. Christopher Brown, for me, is the forgotten victim of this whole sorry episode. Christopher Brown was uh, a lad from the, the south of England who moved to Newcastle to try and start a career as a karate instructor, whose only mistake was to meet Samantha Stobart and start a relationship with Samantha Stobart. While Raoul Mott was in prison, Samantha had a number of conversations. She used the expression or, or used the excuse that he was a police officer. I don't think that she did that to pur purposely provoke Moat. I think she was doing that to try and frighten him off. But unfortunately, it had exactly the opposite effect and it did in fact provoke him. Chris Brown wasn't and never had been a police officer. This apparently innocent lie told by Sam about her new boyfriend would have fatal consequences. Raoul Moat hated the police and the thought of his ex dating a copper made him furious. Raoul's attitude to the police, he just hated them. He wanted nothing to do with the police, he just didn't like them at all. He believed the police, the social services, the prison authorities, his ex-girlfriends were all picking on him, but it was nothing to do with him. One of the traits that we find really quite often when it comes to violence within relationships 
is that there's an externalization of blame. It's always somebody else's fault. When people externalize blame, it's not always simply directed at an individual. It's, it's more of a characteristic within them, an enduring trait. So often that, that blame will be put on anybody who's a ready-made target. The police can be targeted. They're seen as being overzealous or picking on people. Fueled by his hatred of the authorities, Moat began to put his plan for revenge against Samantha Stobart into place. While still in prison, he quickly contacted the outside world. One of the first people he called was an old friend, Carl Ness. Moat had tasked Carl Ness to get a certain individual to visit him in prison while he was in prison because he wanted to speak to him about getting a, a car with six wheels. A car with six wheels, as far as I'm concerned, and my inquiry team were concerned, was a gun with six cartridges. That individual was a suspected armourer. So I think it was a reasonable assumption that we were working on that that was him trying to secure a weapon for when he got released from prison. Moat was released from Durham prison on Thursday the 1st of July, and he wasted no time putting his plan into action. On coming out of prison, he'd effectively lost everything that he had been sustained by emotionally. With little to lose, there, there was the possibility at that point that, that he would seek revenge in an extreme way. We have CCTV footage of uh, Carl Ness turning up at Moat's home address, carrying what we believed to be the gun in a blue bag, which was later recovered from the scene. We got evidence from computers and telephones that they were trying to contact sports centres in the Butley area where it was believed that Christopher Brown was operating his business as a karate instructor. They were doing dummy runs. Again, I believe, trying to find out who Christopher Brown was, identify a car, identify him. As well as tracking down their target, Moat and Ness started planning for the aftermath and the possibility that they would be on the run. Balmoat was caught on CCTV in the B&Q store in Scotswood in Newcastle, picking up camping supplies and, and the, sort of, the sort of thing you would need to live out in the countryside. Hours later, their hunt for Chris Brown proved successful. They had tracked both him and Samantha down to a friend's house in Bertley, near Gateshead. That's when Moat and Ness put the plan into practice, where they lay in wait outside the house until the early hours of the morning. Moat was sitting outside the window of the house where Sam and her new boyfriend were that night. They were having a few drinks together, you know, just having a normal night, talking and laughing. Text messages between Moat's phone and Carl Ness's phone show that he was listening to what they were saying and he was, he was getting agitated, hearing them laughing and having a good time. So you're all in this house and I'm in the garden, slagging me off nice and proper. My suffering is so funny, apparently. I'm gonna kick off nice and proper when they come out. Then we'll see who's laughing. After a few more drinks, Sam and Chris decided to call it a night and went to leave the house. Samantha Stobard and Christopher Brown came out of that address in, in, in Berkeley in the early hours of the morning, where they were immediately confronted by Raoul Moat. Without warning, he shot Christopher Brown, shot him a second time, and then he followed him onto a grassed area where Christopher had staggered and fell to the ground and shot him a third time as he lay, wounded and defenceless. Then turned the gun on Samantha, shooting through the window of the address, causing her critical injuries. Following the shootings, Moat ran off into the night. Apart from being spotted briefly on CCTV, he disappeared, leaving carnage in his wake. I knew Raoul was not that, but I didn't think he was capable. Oh, wait. I didn't think he would do something like that, but he was obviously he was, he's that sort of person to be capable to get a hold of weapons and stuff like that, but I just didn't think he would actually kill someone. Why he did it was he would never allow Sam to be with anyone else. I mean, I never in a million years thought he would ever kill anybody, maybe threaten them, but not shoot them. 
it was just such a shock. And then for him to shoot Samantha as well, that just, I, I just couldn't believe it. He, he said himself, the only reason he shot her, where he shot her, so she couldn't wear a bikini and show other men a figure. That was typical Raoul. Nobody else was allowed to look at Samantha. This is the scar where they had to cut open to check my organs, because obviously the bullet hit through my organs and damaged a lot of them. As Samantha recovered in hospital and mourned her dead boyfriend, Raoul Mote had gone to ground. But the police were quick to identify him as the prime suspect in the shootings. It was very, very quickly known to us that Raoul Mote was a man responsible. Officers who were attending that scene were getting told very quickly, Raoul Mote was responsible for this. As the police launched their murder investigation, on the Saturday night, Moat broke cover and visited an old friend, Andy McAllister, who had been watching the events in Berkeley unfold on TV. I was a Saturday night, the North East News on Saturday night. We were half past 10, quarter 11. And it's mentioned a shooting in Gateshead, and I was watching it, and it brought his pitch on the telly. As the hunt for Raul... And I knew he had getting out of the jail on the Thursday. And within less than two minutes, it was a lucky door, and it was Raul. And then he shipped me, son. One of the shootings linked to Mo he come in, well, he had a paper on his hand. He explained what he'd done. He said, look, I'm sorry, but I've, I've done this, Andy. I'll phone the police now. I said, I'll phone it. It's a crime of passion, mate. You've been pushed over the top. I said, well, get your hand in. That's a crime of passion, mate. You're not getting much. You're maybe he's eight, ten, yeah. Moat had no intention of handing himself in. He left Andy McAllister's house, and at 12.27 a.m., he called the police. This is Vic Gunman from Berkeley last night. Uh, my name is Raoul Moat. Um, what I'm phoning about is to tell you exactly why I've done what I've done. The investigation took a significant escalation on the Saturday night with a phone call from Raoul Moat claiming responsibility for the shooting of Christopher Brown, but more worryingly declaring effective war on Northumbria police because it was his belief that Christopher Brown was a police officer. Now, my girlfriend has been having an affair behind my back. But one of your officers, this gentleman that I shot last night, the Claudia instructor. He perceived that Northumbria police were harassing him and were picking on him. So this was his way of taking his revenge. And unfortunately, within minutes of that call, he then approached and shot David Rathband. PC David Rathband, a traffic officer for Northumbria Police, had one of the best records in the force. Well, David's actually my younger brother, but you'd think he was my big brother, <laughs> my protector, always looked after not just me, all of us. He was like the rock, a family man with family values, morals, everything. David was just David. <laughs> He said to me that he felt sometimes he had a criminal mind and that's why it made him a, a good cop. But he was a good-natured person, so obviously, you know, he wanted, to, he wanted to nail the bad guys. And I think he has a profound sense of right or, or wrong. After the shooting, it was widely portrayed in the media that PC Rathband was the victim of an unknown assailant. In fact, the officer had crossed paths with Moat before. The incident took place in March 2009. David pulled over this, this vehicle, which was pulling into a scrapyard in, in Bladen, just on the outskirts of Newcastle. The van driver was Raoul Mote. David says that Raoul Mote failed the attitude test on that day. And the small chit-chat turned to aggressive rants from Mote about anything, from social services to, you know, not being able to see his children, to trying to, you know, earn a crust and the police stopping it. But the significance of David's first meeting with Mo is that he couldn't get Mo out of his head. And David used a phrase to me which, you know, comes back to haunt us. He said, Mo will come again, and Mo did. In the early hours of Sunday the 4th of July, David Rathband had parked his patrol car on the junction of the A1 and the A69 just outside Newcastle. 
It was a pretty ordinary night in Newcastle. Not much to happen. David Rathband felt a presence. And the next thing he knew, there was a tink on the glass. And it was Moat. Moat shot him, probably blinded him on the first shot, waited. And as David is trying to bring himself round, Moat shot him again and left him for what Moat thought was for dead. And sometime later, David summoned up the last amount of courage, energy that he had to get on the police radio. One of the officers heard the words, I've been shot. I was just told over the phone that he'd been shot. I didn't know where he'd been shot, but I knew there was, it had been some effect on his eyes. But I didn't know exactly where he'd been shot. Um, and all I knew, that he was alive. That was it, it was very basic information. Moments later, ambulances and, and the police were at the scene and Moat was fleeing off into Northumberland. Personally, I took it as an insult. That was a colleague of mine who had been shot doing the job that I've done over and over and over again for a number of years. Uh, it could have been any one of us that was the point that this investigation became from a relatively straightforward murder inquiry to a significant manhunt where public safety, the safety of police officers, became a huge priority and issue for us. As Moat fled the scene of the shooting, he paid a final visit to Andy McAllister. I must have been about half past one, two o'clock in the morning. They couldn't find him. And I got another door, it was Carl. And uh, he said, look, he wants you. And he was parked outside. I went and spoke to him in the car. We talked. And he asked for a phone. He said, yeah, you got a phone I can have? Because the police just aren't taking it seriously. So I gave him my contract. I had a contract phone, I took my SIM card up and I gave him the phone. And I said then, how are you, mate? Look, let's stop it now. We'll hand it in. We'll get it finished before it gets too far. And he just says, not a chance. And he gives a 20-page statement. He says, I want that handed to the police. I want as much press known about it as possible because they're not taking it seriously. And he says, no, I'm going to take as many of the mood as I can. In the summer of 2010, the whole country was on alert. Gunman Raoul Moat was on the run after shooting his ex-girlfriend and murdering her new partner. He'd also effectively declared war on the authorities by shooting police officer David Rathband, leaving him blind and fighting for his life. Moat, along with two accomplices, had left Newcastle and headed north. Despite his violent rampage, Moat was convinced the police weren't taking him seriously. So he made a series of calls to officers claiming responsibility. As he left the city behind him, he made one final call. Sometime after the shooting, he made, he made a further phone call uh, and, and, and again taunt the police. Do you believe me now? Do you believe me now? And claiming responsibility for shooting PC Rathband. And he was clearly quite angry at that stage with Northumbria police, making it plain that we weren't going to find him, that he was going to take more victims if he had the chance. Whilst he was on the phone, Moat dropped a bombshell. Moat made it plain on his second phone call he had two hostages, but we had no evidence to suggest who these hostages may be. In fact, Moat's hostages were actually his accomplices. Carl Ness, and now a second conspirator, Kuram Awan. Carl Ness was the man who assisted Moat when he was in prison. I think he lived a bit in awe of Moat. He was quite subservient to him. Awan was a bit more of a difficult one to sort of line up the association, but what our inquiries revealed was that Awan was more of an associate of Ness, so that was where the sort of association came together. 
By the Sunday morning, police had conclusively linked the shootings of Chris Brown, Samantha Stobart and David Rathband. Raoul Mote was now officially a wanted man, but he disappeared. Their hunt for the fugitive was about to shift focus to the most unlikely of places. A peaceful market town called Rothbury. Police were in a race against time to stop him before Mote could strike again. They got the breakthrough they needed on Monday the 6th of July with reports of an armed robbery in the village of Seton Deliver. A man walked into the chip shop and threatened the staff and stole a hundred pound at gunpoint. Very quickly, our suspicions were that that was Moat and this was him breaking cover to get himself some money and some food. Detectives quickly realised that the car in which Moat was travelling could be the vital clue. They made the decision to ask members of the public to help track down the vehicle. The decision to go public and ask for public assistance in finding Awan's vehicle was the breakthrough that led the police inquiry to Rothbury, because a member of the public phoned in early on the Tuesday morning to report that she'd seen that car. It was found next to some industrial units just on the edge of Rothbury. As the police were securing the vehicle, the activity was seen by the group. They split up at that point, and this and Awan made their way out onto a main road and started walking away from Rothbury in a main road where the police helicopter was able to track them and they were very quickly contained and arrested. I think the real frustration is there, we were very, very close to Raoul Moat at that point. With Moat's accomplices now in custody, the quiet Northumberland town of Rothbury became front page news across the country as officers and vehicles from 19 police forces descended on the area. Rothbury is in the north of the country, it's in Northumberland. We sit within the Coquit Valley, which is quite a remote and sparsely populated area, and Rothbury is the main village stroke market town in the centre of the Coquit Valley. He was hiding out in thousands and thousands of acres of dense woodland, cliffs, undergrowth, and it was as challenging a terrain as you could imagine, to try and search for somebody. Not just search for somebody who may be lost, but search for somebody who's hiding from you and who's armed and wants to kill you. When the manhunt moved to Rothbury, I think mean, everyone in, in the town was stunned. They'd never seen anything like this. Very quickly, a normal week in the summer was ruined by armed police arriving in the town. There was armed police officers brought in from right across the UK. There was vehicles provided by the police service in Northern Ireland, all to be deployed in the hunt for Raoul Moat and the protection of the public in and around Rothbury and Northumberland. Specialist search teams supported by armed police and sniper units began combing the wilderness surrounding Rothbury for any evidence of the fugitive gunman. Very quickly, we were able to identify the remains of a campsite, which was clearly the campsite that these guys had been hiding in. We were able to recover some interest and evidence from there. We were able to link the tent that was from there back to one that Ness had bought in B&Q on the Friday evening. But significantly, there was a dictaphone where he had verbalised his thoughts, his accounts, his excuses for shooting these people and killing Christopher Brown. But the more worrying and sinister part was he had also verbalised his intention to turn on the public. This had come about by details of his personal life being exposed. And I think it was reporting about his mother and, and things that his mother had said about him that really tipped him over the edge. And he said at this time that for every inaccurate thing he read in the papers or, or anything that upset him that he saw or heard, he would harm a member of the public. I'm gonna get the lot of years. I've just been listening to the fucking radio and all. What a bunch of tosses. One of the ways that we could prevent that from happening was to get the media to temper the reporting, particularly around Moat himself, Moat the individual. That was the bits he clearly didn't like. All newspapers, television and radio were told they could report the manhunt, but we all signed an agreement saying that we wouldn't report anything about Moat's personal life. 
with the risks so high, the media complied with the police's requests, and reporting of Moat's personal life was now off limits. The manhunt, however, continued to be the lead story on news programs and front pages up and down the country, with journalists adding to the drama that was unfolding. The language that the media used, I think, was very revealing about the way in which the whole story was represented and understood. The police say the net is tightening. So Raoul Moat was referred to by the media as being Britain's most wanted man. Britain's most wanted man, murder suspect Raoul Moat. Seven days to find the most wanted man in Britain. The media talked about Rothbury being a town under siege. They talked about Rothbury being in lockdown. At two o'clock, the local middle school went into lockdown. It also relies very heavily on fictional representations of crime. Here we had a kind of outlaw gunman on the loose in the countryside. He says he won't be taken alive. The stakes in this search have never been higher. This is something that we're probably more used to seeing from Hollywood movies or, or American TV shows. And the language and the whole representation of the events by the media reflected that kind of narrative of what was happening. What was a murder investigation and, and a manhunt and the search for a very dangerous man had taken on a, a life of its own and in a sort of entertainment way by this point. There were reports that Paul Gascoigne had, had come up to see him and that um, Gaza had been a friend of Moat and they'd known each other from, from when uh, Moat was working in the town and Gaza had been going to, to pubs and clubs. Paul Gascoigne had indeed made the trip to Rothbury but in fact was stopped at a police cordon well outside the town. He later stated he was unaware of the severity of Moat's crimes. It was strange because obviously these are such tragic events and suddenly there was a strange comic side to it that Paul Gascoigne had become involved. Despite the frenzied media coverage, there was no doubt in the police's mind quite how serious the situation in Rothbury was becoming. Moat was armed, threatening to kill innocent people and was on the loose in thousands of acres of wilderness. This was probably the most dangerous situation that I've ever been involved in. Dangerous for the, the public in terms of the threat. We had clear, declared intent by this individual to harm members of the public or members of Northumbria Police. Raoul Moat very much led police on a chase around this um, large amount of countryside. He was moving around and he was being followed, but he was just moving out of the police's reach all the time. One of the sightings was that he'd been seen up near the middle school. I believe they'd potentially found a mobile phone up there that had put him within that area, and I think there was an immediate concern. If he's in that area, let's ensure that the school children are safe. There were officers stationed all the way around the building. Um, if he was in that area, he certainly wasn't getting anywhere near that school. The reports of Moat near the school turned out to be a false alarm. To the residents of Rothbury, though, it was just another example of how unreal the situation in their town was becoming. A lot of residents said to me that when they were watching the news in the evening and they saw the police searching cars and, and there was police officers stationed on the bridge and at the entrances and exits to Rothbury, it was hard to believe that this was happening half a mile away within our own village. It was, it was like a different world. It was like something you would see in London or in one of the major cities, not in a small village in, in, in rural Northumberland. It's not, it's not something that happens every day. The hunt for moat continued until Friday the 9th of July. Then, at around 7 p.m., Moat was spotted emerging from the woods that surrounded the town. He'd lain low there for a number of days. He had no access to food or water other than what he could find in the forest. It had been pretty wet on and off, and I just think that gets a stage where uh, any human being has had enough. He had his gun in his hand. He was lying there. It felt like everything was against him by that point. From my investigation, it became quite clear that he was pretty suicidal. When we searched his house, we found a noose that was already in place in the loft, and we found a number of suicide notes to friends and associates. So here was a man that was clearly contemplating taking his own life, and even up to his phone calls to the police, he was claiming that he wouldn't be taken alive. 
he mentioned something about not having a father, which was some of the last words that, that we know he said, and how the root cause of all this was his poor family relationships and his, his, the lack of a father figure in his life. Just after midnight, six hours into the standoff, and with the weather deteriorating, negotiators reported a change in Moat's behaviour. Moat's demeanour changed slightly and he moved the gun to a different position. They could tell that something was going to happen. In a split second, you had two officers firing their taser weapons and you had negotiators shouting at him to put his gun down. The mood changed, he made the decision and he pulled the trigger. The critically injured gunman was rushed to hospital, but doctors couldn't save him. Moat died later that morning. His death, however, did not mark the end of the story. The subsequent trial of his accomplices would reveal bizarre facts that would shock the nation. Worse still, and with a complete lack of respect for his victims, Moat would be mourned by some as a hero. The manhunt to capture fugitive Raoul Moat had ended with the gunman shooting himself after a standoff in the rural Northumberland town of Rothbury. The hunt had involved hundreds of officers from 19 separate police forces and had cost over one and a half million pounds. Although the threat from Moat died with him that night, the police's job was far from over. At the beginning of 2011, Moat's accomplices stood trial at Newcastle Crown Court. A variety of charges, including conspiracy to murder Chris Brown and um, the attempted murder of David Rathband. I think it was important that Ness and Awan were brought to justice because Moat couldn't have done this on his own. He needed the help. He needed somebody to help him source the gun when he was in prison. He needed somebody to try and help him find out what Samantha was doing. So for me, it was really important that those that helped him were brought to justice. It became strange that these two characters had been prepared to help Moat carry out such horrific crimes. And, you know, they're seen laughing and joking in the aisles of Tesco, buying things like sauce, as if they were going to a barbecue. To hear the witnesses who were passed off as hostages, they'd written letters saying, I'm safer than safe. They'd gone shopping for chicken wraps in Subway. When they robbed the chippy in Seton Delaville, Moat supposedly shouted, Wonga! They were a few miles away at the McDonald's and a police car pulled up and one of the accomplices said something to the effect of, do we want to do him? And the other said, no, let Ralph finish his McFlurry. All these bizarre details the evidence against both men was, was pretty overwhelming. CCTV f featured hugely, particularly in terms of Awan. Although Awan claimed that he was a hostage, we have numerous pieces of CCTV where he's gone out and uh, did the shopping for, for Raoul Moat. So the evidence was quite overwhelming in that sense, and, and the jury agreed. Carl Ness was found guilty of murdering Christopher Brown and the attempted murder of Samantha Stobart. Both he and Kuram Awan were also found guilty of several other charges, including the attempted murder of David Rathband. The sentences handed down reflected the severity of their crimes. Both got life sentences. Awan got a minimum recommendation to serve 20 years and Ness got a minimum recommendation to serve 40 years. The culmination of the trial seemingly drew a line under the Raoul Moat saga. With those affected by his actions satisfied that, at least in part, justice had been done. When they read the verdict, the best part of a year's worth of emotion, I think, clearly freed itself from David's soul and guilty, you know, guilty, without a shadow of a doubt, all of them. Throughout the manhunt, and especially after its violent end, pages on various social media sites began to appear. While many condemned Moat for his actions, a few confounded public opinion by portraying him as a hero. I think in the immediate aftermath, there were concerns raised about the 
glamorization of Raoul Moat. There were, you know, media stories about people visiting the site where he died. There were stories about Facebook groups being set up to, to celebrate Raoul Moat. He was clearly not a man who deserved to be glamorized in any in, in those ways whatsoever. He was, to some, like a Robin Hood figure. He, he was making a stand for, for the normal man against the police. Children were going around singing a song that went something like, Raoul Moat is the man, he'll catch the coppers when he can. The fact that he was a murderer had sort of escaped some people. He'd murdered one person and shot at two other people. There was nothing heroic about it. There was certainly nothing to, to, to glorify. One of the things about extreme behavior is that it generates extreme reactions. There were certainly people who, who were keen to idolize Raoul Moat. I mean, I think the question for us as a society is, is, what do we make of that? Why is that happening? Incredibly, even a year after the standoff, floral tributes would still appear at the scene of Moat's death, much to the anger of local residents. It's not something that we as a community want to mark in any way, shape or form. We, we were, it's a chapter in our history that we want to put behind us and, and, and move on from. We don't want to be reminded of it. As the family of Christopher Brown mourned his death, Samantha Stubbart, permanently scarred by moat, was released from hospital to rebuild her life. PC David Rathband carried on his personal battle with his injuries. Completely blinded by moat's shotgun, he set up the Blue Lamp Foundation, a charity to raise money to help emergency service personnel injured in the line of duty. PC David Rathbun pretty much amazed everyone in, in the weeks, I mean, well, days and, and weeks after the shooting. He came out very quickly stating his intention to return to the police force, which I think everyone was, was amazed by. David had this public persona, and he was happy to be in the limelight to keep the case in the memory, to raise money for his charity. But behind closed doors, you know, his... His life was stress and, and trauma, and people didn't see that. On the evening of Wednesday, the 29th of February, 2012, David Rathband was found dead at his home. He had committed suicide. It's like anybody, isn't it? You just wish you'd had one last conversation that meant something. The last conversation we had was, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. You're not all right, are you? No, no, I'm fine. And... You know, days later, uh, that was the end. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, you know, he's the first person close to me that I've ever lost. And um, he transferred many of his emotions to, to, to me, and um, that will never leave me. You know, I, I would do it all again, uh, because he's an incredible guy. Um, Incredible, incredible guy. Being close to David and seeing the real David and the real struggles and his day-to-day -day life, what he'd been left with, I, no, I wasn't surprised. I was heartbroken, but I wasn't surprised. I didn't blame David. I couldn't... I couldn't be cross with, with him because I understood he, he's, he's still here, he's in my heart and he always will be and I will talk about him. In 2016, the family of David Rathband lost a civil action after filing a negligence claim against Northumbria Police. In the aftermath of the events in Rothbury, the Independent Police Complaints Commission conducted a thorough inquiry into the death of Raoul Moat, ultimately endorsing police actions in the standoff. It's easily the biggest policing operation I've been involved in. The force was able to rise to that challenge. I think about the victims. I think about Christopher Brown. I think about Dave Rathband. I think the big thing for me was nobody else got hurt, despite Moat's intentions, nobody else got hurt.